it's June 5th, 2024. I'll call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's hearing. Uh, one agenda item, as you can see on the screen, the Vermont Medicare Hospital Global Payment Design Methods Paper. We've received some public comment and we have a potential vote noticed. That will be presented by Michelle Degree. And before that, I would like to turn to the minutes of May 29th, which I move to approve. Second. Second. All in favor of approval, say aye. 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 Aye, and the minutes are approved. Uh, Ms. Barrett, do you have a director's report for us today? Yes, uh, a couple of brief announcements. First, uh, on Monday, June 10th, the board will hold its general advisory committee meeting. That will start at 2 p.m., and that is via Teams. It's on our schedule, so please join if you can. And um, in terms of public comments, just one ongoing right now, and that is on a next potential model with CMMI, the AHEAD model. We are accepting public comments, and as always, share those public comments with the Agency of Human Services as they are leading the negotiations of that model. And I, that is all I have. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. I think you're on. Um, I keep hitting the wrong buttons. I'm on camera. I'm not on mic. I don't <laughs> got it all backwards. Um, thank you, Ms. Barrett. Mr. Gree, could you please uh, take over the presentation while I figure out how to use the clicker? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Give me just one moment. OK, are you all able to see that? Yes, perfect. And you can hear me yes. OK. All right. Um, so as Chair Foster mentioned, we are here today to discuss the Vermont Medicare Hospital Global Payment Update. Um, and again, today's focus is on the methods paper, which we last reviewed on May 22nd. Um, uh, as usual, we'll start off today um, with uh, a quick overview of the timeline. Um, and then again, as Chair Foster noted, we did receive some public comment. I have done my best to pull together some themes from those comments um, as of uh, this morning. So that includes four to date as of this morning. Um, and we've included proposed updated language based on the board's conversations. Um, on um, updated principles. And then again, uh, we have a vote noticed for today as well. Quick overview, you've seen this slide before. As you can see, we're slowly making our way down. Uh, the highlighted box is where we are today. Um, so again, potential vote scheduled with a sort of version one of the global payment methodology due to CMMI no later than July 1st, which you see on this slide as well. Um, Again, as of this morning, we've received four public comments, two of which were from hospitals. Overarching themes found in each are outlined on this slide. Um, I'll note that each comment did note the overall complexity of the model itself and highlighted Vermont's historically low Medicare spend. Other topics included regulatory implications and concerns for administrative burden. Uh, I would say that was for both participating hospitals and other parties, including the board. Comments also pressed on the theory of change and planning for hospital transformation support. Timelines were mentioned in several of the comments, uh, kind of highlighting both regulatory alignment and overall implementation timelines. And enforcement and accountability were also mentioned. Uh, this was rel uh, largely specific to participating hospitals. Uh, you've seen this slide before too, a reminder of what the board is voting on. Um, in this instance, we're talking about submission of the Vermont specific Medicare global budget specification, which is consistent with the methods paper that has been reviewed with you all. Um, another reminder that the methodology is not a done deal. It's subject to negotiation um, and the board will vote on participation in the AHEAD model sort of at large by June 30th, 2025. Um, 
Again, at the last meeting on May 22nd, the board discussed delegation of the draft Vermont specific Medicare Medicare hospital global payment within the broader context of state health reform strategies and regulations to staff consistent with a set of principles agreed upon by the board. Um, staff have worked to take suggestions from prior meetings and conversations into an updated set of principles, which I will show you on the next slide. And I just wanted to note as another reminder that staff have also begun collecting a head specific negotiation principle. So thinking about the broader agreement here and we'll discuss those at a future meeting. Um, we've currently not been notified of acceptance by CMI into the program, but we will continue to collect sort of those principles as well. Here are updates to the principles um, as discussed again on May 22nd and I think probably May 15th also. Um, I have uh, included in the appendix the original of this slide in case we need to toggle. I've, I've done my best to sort of highlight the changes here in red text um, with an alternative suggested under the first uh, principle there. So um, just want to give you sort of a, a, a moment to go through these. I'm, I'm happy to read through them if that's helpful. Um, most of the changes were just um, about uh, ability to measure um, and um, thinking through, you know, the the, the board's uh, position in this at large. Um, and then with one entire addition, um, number seven on the list here, hospital participation in a global payment program should maintain or reduce administrative burden for payers and providers over time. So I'll give you all a moment to peruse and we can have a discussion on any, any of these as needed. Um, this is going to be a quick one. So <laughs> uh, the the, uh, this language you've also seen before, um, this again is um, the vote asking the board to delegate to staff the submission of a draft non-binding Medicare um, global payment methodology and specification consistent with the principles that the staff have outlined on slide seven and potentially as modified today. Um, so I'll go back to that slide for some discussion and uh, we'll turn it back to you, Chair Foster. Um, one quick note on um, slide seven, it referenced slide seven for the principles, but I think it should be slide six. Because I changed something um, this morning. Which, Thank you. Them... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that happens to me all the time. Um, I wouldn't mind just a minute here just to read through. Um, so why don't we just take a second because I want to make sure I got all the changes. Absolutely, and I'm happy to toggle between um, the original as well, if that would be helpful. Um, but the the red text are the main changes here. Okay, I think do people need a little bit more time or are they? Okay, great. Um, I'll open it up to the board for any comments or uh, suggestions or questions they may have. I just have one question, uh, allows for offsets in principle six. Um, can you just describe what that means? This is an attempt to um, to 
to talk. I don't want to speak for, for board members who have proposed this language, but um, an attempt to um, talk about sort of the, I don't want to call it cost shift either. Um, I'm just going to stop talking. Owen, do you want to talk about this a little bit? I think you had some questions about commercial cost mostly, and I, I don't want to uh, speak for you or, or misspeak. Uh, sure. I, I don't think I proposed this language, but the concept of ensuring a reduction to commercial was a concept that I've been pushing for um, in this process. And you know, I think I've said it in a couple of these hearings, but actually having a mechanism to ensure that if we're getting additional money from Medicare, that's accruing to the benefit of our high commercial costs and to put more pressure to make sure we get that money from Medicare, given where we are in commercial, but allows for offset wasn't my language, although I'm OK with the concept, it could be requires offsets or something more uh, prescriptive, but I'm, I'm OK with it either way. But I think that's probably what it's trying to get at. Thank you. And I agree with the principle and the concept, Owen. I just was trying to understand what allows for offsets meant. Could it could we change the language? Um, Instead of allows for offsets, it would be methodology leads to a reduction in Vermont's commercial, high commercial insurance. I think it's actually the hospital budget process that leads to the offsets, right? Because a payment methodology tells one payer how to pay and how much to pay. It's the hospital budget process that then measures that payment against the completion of the hospital budgets and the contributions by the other payers. So um yeah, I mean, so it's, maybe I think, it's sorry. Let me let me interrupt because I think the the concept we were trying to work on with Mathematica was to not make it the hospital budget process, but rather the methodology itself. So that if there can be an increased payment from Medicare, if the commercial requests are lower to actually make it part of the methodology. So I think the intent in this one is to make it part of the methodology. I think if that's the case, then I would. Maybe try to use some stronger language than allows for offsets. Um, like um, the methodology yeah, leads, 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 leads to, leads to reduction. reduction. Yeah. <laughs> Can I show you the, the prior language and maybe that will help this conversation? I'm just going to skip a couple of slides. So use this last bullet point here. Is that language you're more comfortable with? I, I kind of like the old Tom one. Shaking I guess. his head. Okay. Yeah. Of the two, I like the old one, but I prefer um, leads to a reduction. I think that's a. I think reducing the commercial insurance costs or rates, I think, is a challenging um, level to reach because of inflation and utilization increases. So I, I just worry that that sort of sets us up for not a chance of succeeding. And if sometimes, you know, say, for instance, an all payer model one, when it was, it's clear that, you know, we're not going to um get all the parties in that we want to you sort of kind of give up on it so i would i would want to keep it achievable so <clears throat> the way that um yeah i think there needs to be more clarity on what we what we actually want um but what was in my mind um with this is if we have a hospital um, fictitious that's at 500%, their prices are 500% of Medicare, that 
<clears throat> yearly over the course of this um, agreement, Medicare will slightly raise its fees, but that 500% number should decline. So uh, I would just say that these are principles and this is all very, we're not gonna get perfect language. Um, I don't wanna like get too bogged down. We could do the new language. We could do the old language. We could do provide for a mechanism to reduce. I mean, this is all gonna be very heavily negotiated over the next 12 months. So I don't wanna get too hung up on specific words here. As long as they convey the intent, I'm fairly comfortable with it. Maybe the easiest is to go back to the old language. Instead of trying to wordsmith in the, in the meeting. Personally, I think the old language is, is okay. I have some things I would express in executive session about negotiating this, but I won't do it in the open session. I think that makes sense. And I'd support the old language. So seems like we're getting a nod from Tom and Jess. So why don't we do that, Michelle? Okay, yep, easy enough. I can um, propose to revert uh, on this one. It's slide, I'm sorry, number um, six to the old language. If I wasn't um, running my old slides, I would do it in real time. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> No worries. Um, I was, I am not that comfortable with the alternative to one because I don't know why we're picking seven years as opposed to five years or eight years. So, I, so since it is a principle, I'm a little more comfortable with the original language. I share that view, Robin. <laughs> I think the the seven years is um, something we could discuss. It, more than half. Um, <laughs> excuse me. My concern with number one is that I don't know what what it means to recognize and account for achievements. I think that's intentionally vague so that we're not showing our cards to CMS. Right, because I think in executive session, we've had some discussions about different methodologies that you could use to incorporate savings, but I think spelling that out here would be a challenge because of the negotiating stuff. I hear you. My, my concern with approaching it that way, um, is that we using unclear language now and using um, kind of try, trying to do this fast <clears throat> gets us to tomorrow quicker and more easily, but down the road, these will become things that we reflect back on and have to decide by. And then we will be arguing over what it means to be recognized or accounted for. And recognized, some could argue that that just means a handshake or a gold star. Others would say that means a hundred million dollars. And so I, I, when I, I think these need to, we need better definitions. I think um, measurably increasing access, what, what would we measure? And increasing revenue predictably, what's predictable. I think having that kind of 
perfection is very difficult to achieve in a set of principles. Um, I think we, I mean, I understand what we mean by low cost. It's in reference to where we are on a per capita spend basis and the NORC evaluations of our or reform efforts. Um, I'm not sure that in connection with principles, we're gonna be able to get to the level of precision on all of these. If you look at many of our statutes, they have a lot of words and language that are open to various interpretation. And in some ways, that's sort of the nature of principles. Um, they can mean different things to different people, um, but. Is there any, let me ask it this way, is there any particular terms or language that are here aside from number seven um, that really give us uh, angst or concern that we think it's wrong or needs uh, a revision? I've made the substitution for number six, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen for a second so you can look at a, a more accurate um, representation. Please hold. I mean, I can speak to that. No, Owen, not specifically on those terms. I mean, I do think the, the first um, principle could be a little bit more specific than recognize and account. I think what we're I think what we've been talking about as a state and the expectation is that we would have we would be some some of that savings, some portion of it would be returned to the state um, as in a way to fund Healthcare transformation to improve the sustainability within our state. So I don't know if recognize an account really captures, I think, the discussion that has been had in and around this topic. But that said, it's it's a group of principles that I think the staff understands clearly what we mean by recognize and accounted for. Yeah, and I, I think, look, I mean, if the methodology comes back or the negotiation comes back in a way that any board member feels does not satisfy their view of what's better for Vermont, then we can change it as we negotiate and you, we can vote no, right? So if recognize, whatever the language is, recognize an account means gold star and a high five, I will predict that I may vote no. So, I mean, you can always use your interpretation of this or your requirements for what that means to you in the negotiation and in the vote. Which to Tom's point, it might be better yet aspirational to have that all hashed out perfectly at this stage. Although I'm not sure if it is attainable. Well, especially considering AHS is leading the negotiation and the third party is the governor's office. So it is a tri party negotiation. Correct. Is there any other board comment or discussion on these? Because there's there's a hand raised at least, which might be beneficial. I, the one other discussion point, I think, on these principles that is not specific to your prior question of this language that, that I have is actually referenced. Mike Fisher's got his hand up from the HCA letter, which I thought was quite, um, I think, important to think about, which is and I don't know again if we need to flush it out in these principles because this is a but I but I think sort of acknowledging the ongoing work with Act 167 and transformation a little bit more deliberately than in principle five to discuss the transformation, the system delivery system transformation. And and I think that their letter speaks to uh like a a, a um a, a model or a, 
a, a, a, I can't remember what the actual term was, uh, to, to a theory. Theory of, of change. Theory of change. I don't know if we need to specify what that theory of change is here, but I think that my view, and I think this is shared by others, is that a lot of that um, theory of change or more the the goal of the change is going to come out through some of this Act 167 work, but probably will continue to to develop over time, you know, as we reflect on that work and 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 uh, and 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 see that play out. So I, I don't know if there's a way to, to to be a little bit to call that out just a little bit more, but that's the only thing that I I would sort of want to add, and I'd have to think about how to put that in. Sorry for not doing that before this meeting. Mr. Fisher. Good afternoon, board. Uh, thank you uh, for letting me hop in here. Um, I think a good comment just now from Member Merman, um, but that's not what I was going to jump in and say. Um, I, I just wanted to note that um, the concept of consumer affordability isn't in here at all. Um, I recognize these are principles, so I'm going to try. I want. I am trying to stay up high on that level. Um, I can read consumer affordability into access. I think access. Uh, I think affordability is an access issue, though most people, when they say the term access, mean like is referenced here, wait times, or providers in their community. Um, so I, I, I just wanted to at least make a shout out about that, that if we think that there is a um, consumer affordability aspect that is being addressed here, um, I think it's unfortunate that it's not mentioned. Um, and then the, the one other thing I'll say is um, um, uh, we, we did comment uh, some about having uh, real measurement. And again, these are principles. You're not going to spell out measurement here. It, it might be that you're doing a shout out to the intent to have um, uh, measurement in, in, in number two and measurably increase increasing access. Um, but um, that's just an overall concern that we uh, learn the lesson from previous efforts and um, uh, really make sure we have measurement of what we're trying to achieve here. Thank you. Can I ask a so on, a quick on affordability? I, I would I, so sometimes I think we reference it in number five, in that Act One Sixty Seven, the access to high quality affordable care consistent with One Sixty Seven and the GMCB's mission and values. Our mission is affordable, accessible, uh, Thank quality you, health care. So, Thank so, you, so by reference, I would say it's there, and I can assure mm -hmm. you it's a top of mind for me anyway, and the others, I'm sure. One way to just make that more concrete would be to take the language in number two and make parallel language around affordability. Many Vermonters continue to struggle with affordability. Um, future efforts to improve healthcare in Vermont must support measurably you know, improving af affordability of healthcare, something that's really just parallel language that spells it out. Why don't we do that and also connect. add? Go ahead, Robin. We connect it back to the payment, Medicare payment methodology. That to me sounds like maybe in a head model principle. That was my question More as than well. Account than a payment methodology. And what I and I think and I was thinking similar to what you were saying about measurement, Mike, are you speaking specifically to measurement of the payment methodology? Or are you speaking more generally to a head? I, I think both. I think and, and it goes a little bit to the theory of, of change, you know, that that um, that we articulate what we think is going to happen and we're and why we believe it'll ha it'll happen, and we can be wrong and and say that, but that we you know we lay out a theory of what we think is happening, and we measure it. Oh, 
I want to jump in for a second to say I do under I also understand that these are principles. I also understand that it's late in the in the process. Um, but the lack of clarity about what we hope to achieve and how we will know when we have it um, is a lesson we should have we should learn from the last model and arriving at a point and saying we need to move too quickly to think through this clearly, I think is a mistake. And I think the part of the principles is to know how you will measure whether you're achieving what you set out to or not. We can disagree about that, but I, I, I wanted to be clear that I think that it's um, moving forward without knowing more concretely what we want, I think is not wise. I would have no problem adding something about uh, to Jess's suggestion of mirroring number two as to measuring affordability. I think it is something we've been trying to work on as a board for the last several months, including with coming up with affordability guidelines and including discussing it in our annual report. So I think it is worthy of doing that. I think it does make sense to also, um, if we need to be more explicit about consumer affordability here, because there is an interplay between Medicare potentially and consumer affordability. So I don't have a problem doing it in this methodology. If those changes are desirable by the other members, I would support them. I think it's a good idea. I'll support it, but I'll just say, I don't think that the Medicare methodology changes Medicare cost sharing. So I don't think it has an impact on what Medicare consumers pay. That's how the MMI's statutory authority goes. Doesn't mean it shouldn't be something to strive for. I just don't think it's legally possible in a Medicare methodology. If we were talking about the AHEAD model, 100% with you. So that's a good that's a good point, Robin. And so are are these Are we then discussing our Medicare principles or are these global budget principles that would also be applicable to commercial payers? These are just the Medicare global budget methodology principles. We're delegating to staff the ability to submit a draft spec Medicare global budget methodology. And these are the principles through which they will uh, try to achieve those, uh, try to shoot for. So the commercial ones may be different, although there's overlap in some sense. And then for the AHEAD model, there's certainly, I have a hard time starting and stopping where the lines are. And I think that's probably, there is a little gray area between where those start and stop. Okay, thanks for clarifying it. I agree with Robin that um, affordability for medi patients receiving medic having Medicare for their payer is a bit harder to um, influence. I'm happy to make a note to add that to the broader list of AHEAD principles that staff are working on. I think that that probably fits better in that category. I'm also happy to add it here um, as suggested. I just, I think there probably will be some overlap between sort of those two sets of principles. I Thank you, Michelle. I agree with you and I agree with Robin. It's If it's Medicare only, then. Uh, 
Um, Mr. Fisher? Yeah, I, that is exactly why I, I prefaced it with, if we think this will have an impact on affordability, then we should say it. I absolutely agree with Robin, with member lunch <laughs> that we're not changing Medicare co-pays methodologies for, you know, um, um, but there is a shout out here to the impact of this money flowing in through Medicare on other parts of the system. And um, and so, I, you know, it, you know, that's why I said it that way. If we think it'll have an impact, then we should say it. Um, if we don't think we it'll have an impact, I, that's also equally important to to be honest about it. Can I, yes, sir. Can, can I just sort of uh, try to try to work out idea <laughs> while I'm thinking of it, Mike? That sort of relates to that, which is so. If we can't change the way copays are calculated for Medicare payment for patients, but if the goal of the ahead model is to use um, to fund services that don't fall under the traditional fee for service payment model, and patients get more of their care by social workers, um, other treatments that help keep them out of the hospital, air conditioners in their home in the summer, whatever you say. I don't want to say that's part of this model, but those are things that have been used in other states through waivers. Um, those things don't generate a copay. So you do, you could see that a global payment leading to reduction in fee-for-service billing could lead to a reduction in copays and increased in affordability for Medicare patients. So, so there, to me, I guess there is a potential connection that that maybe is enough to call it out in this principle to, to make to think about how we ensure that um, those types of lower cost services are utilized within this health reform effort. And those lower cost services don't generate professional billing. Sometimes. That makes sense, Dave, but that kind of stuff will not be in the specification, the payment specification, right? Because those are things that happen through the transformation activities at the hospital level, but it doesn't change the Medicare payment specification that Medicare implements. It would be something that the hospital and, you know, through the delivery system transformation and the transformation activities could promote. And I, so I think it'd be great to include it in the AHEAD principles and uh, as well as, you know, we should probably be thinking about some principles when we get there around the Act 167 work and make sure they're compatible. Robin, how do you think about affordability and um, the inflation adjustments that would be made in the Medicare uh, methodology? Do you mean co-pays and co-insurance? No, I mean like what we use as an inflator on the growth, annual for growth Medicare. for Medicare. Yeah, whether we use Medicare market well, basket or some other like, mechanism, I, like does that affect your thoughts on this? That's my question. I would fold that into six. Because the, the inflation factor, again, the inflation factor doesn't spill over into the co-payments or the co-insurance that Medicare charges. That's those are those would be separately. My understanding, and we need to clarify this with CMS because it's not really in the NOFO. But my understanding is that remains like tied to the Medicare fee for service amount, which they will have for all the other states. So our inflation factor will not impact whether it's high or low or whatever. It doesn't impact the the coinsurance charged to Medicare beneficiaries. But it could affect through so number six. I, yeah. So I think you get at that through number six. Right. Okay. So that's where you get the affordability impact yeah. potentially. Yep. And it's almost like if you added the parallel language, but really it's tied to number six. So you combined what could be 2A and six into one principle. Yes or no? I, 
I, I think you could do that. I think you could do, if what you're talking about with affordability is commercial affordability, which I think is what you mean when you reference, you know, how big or little the inflation factor is in terms of how that then impacts the hospital's larger budget, which then folds into how it impacts the commercial insurance. I think you could, uh, you know, maybe it's something like seek to reduce Vermont's high commercial insurance costs and improve consumer affordability. But again, to me, the, the mechanism, I know, Owen, your concept is to take it out of the hospital budget process. I, I think the hospital budget process is still going to be in the middle of that. Michelle, did you get all that? I think so. Would you like me to try to make another real-time change? I'll just have to pull no. my slides down for a second. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't want you to do that. Um, is so we have the two. We have the change on number six, which I think we have agreement on. I think we have agreement to add um, a, a parallel to number two as to affordability, uh, to measure affordability, and I think the concept of affordability is captured in five and six. Are there other changes we would like to make to direct the staff as to what we'd like to see in the methodology in the spec that they submit? Can I ask one clarifying question, Chair Foster? I think, but from the conversation, did we decide that we want a 2A, as <laughs> Member Holmes said, or are we thinking of adding um, to the end of number six, um, I believe it was Member Lunge's language of improved consumer affordability sort of to the end of that sentence, or both? I <laughs> don't have any desires myself either way. Okay. I'm indifferent. Okay. I think it's cleaner to add it to six because I think, yep. you know, I, I, but I do like the idea of replicating two or what we're calling two A in the ahead principles because I think yes. it fits really nicely there. Yeah. Which I know we don't have in front of us, so that makes it a lot. Okay. I have them in my brain. I will add it to the ahead principles, a replicate of two, two A, and then we'll add the language about affordability to the end of number six. Any other board comment, questions, or suggestions on this? The only other thing I wanted to flag was just that number seven is entirely new. I, I haven't heard comment on it. Maybe that means everybody agrees. I just wanted to flag that's one that has not been shown in this um, setting before. Yeah, thank you. No, I, I had read that and I thought it was a, a good addition for sure. We We are... We have heard board members raise a lot of alarm or concern about what this does for administrative burden, having two sets of books for hospitals. So I, I think it's logical and, and supported. Is it achievable? I think That's because a good it question. says maintain maintain or reduce it's achievable because I think that um, I don't know that like I think that hospitals now maintain a bunch of different payment mechanisms with different payers like there are some bundles with some payers and not with others so there's and there's tons of fee-for-service complexity so um, and also in theory although this obviously is less of an issue with the new legislation, with commercial, you get to a point where you would have fewer prior authorizations, which potentially could reduce administrative burdens. So I think it's potentially achievable. With Medicare, I think it's probably maintain and not reduce, but um, 
you know, I would love if it resulted in a reduction of administrative burden. I guess my question it's, why I asked that is when you were talking specifically about a Medicare payment method, if we, um, does, is it possible specifically for just Medicare to, to maintain it if there's both a global payment method and then keeping track of fee-for-service with a um, fee-for-service related co-payment? Yeah, well, I mean, there's under Medicare providers still do shadow billing like they currently do under the AIPBP, so that should be the same um, for hospitals. Uh, I think for primary care providers, depending on how the negotiation goes with the MIPS stuff, you know, I think that's a little more up in the air. But with that, you know, if they were moving into fee for service at the expiration of the current model, then they'd have full blown MIPS, plus they'd lose the 5% uh, fee for service bump that they currently get. So there's a financial hit. It's a little hard to figure it out, but I think. I think it's a good principle and certainly we have probably limited ability to influence Medicare's operations, but to the extent that we can, we should certainly attempt to do that. And um, for example, with the waivers, there can be some administrative stuff that goes along with the waivers. So if there's a way we can influence to make that less burdensome, that would be good. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know, Dave, but I, I still think it's a good principle to strive I, for. I, I do too. I was actually just, I'm, at, I'm really happy to hear you talk through it and to, to, to learn from your perspective. So I, um, I, I do too. So it's we call out hospital participation in this. Should we call out other participation? And you reference primary care providers, but should we say provider participation? Well, it's, now I'm mixing up the ahead and the global payment stuff. Right, right, right. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> so I maybe this is one that we tweak for the ahead principles, which would include primary care providers. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm going to turn to public comment via the raise the hand function. Uh, Ms. Aronoff, how are you? Go ahead. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and board members and folks on the line. I'm well. Um, I'd like to just focus on the first bullet point a moment. Vermont's a low, care, low cost Medicare state with a long history of health care reform, which has resulted in substantial savings to Medicare. I just want to stop there and say that sometimes the healthcare efforts, healthcare reform efforts, have been supported with Medicaid funds, particularly the original all-payer model agreement and our then executed global commitment waiver for Medicaid. They were linked, executed in tandem, simultaneously, intentionally. And then there were funds built, Medicaid funds, built into the global commitment waiver specifically to support standing up the all payer model. And these Medicaid funds, I just want to pause here and say, I, for the record, my name's Susan Aronoff. I do the policy work for the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. The people whose interests I represent if they're very, very, very lucky, receive home and community-based services 
that are funded by Medicaid. And these home and community-based services that keep people out of nursing homes, out of institutions, out of hospitals, are not entitlements. They're like optional. And so when you have a finite pot of money like Medicaid, and then you use those Medicaid dollars for something other than to support these people who depend on home and community-based services, which are optional, you are by necessity depriving those people of money in their part of the pot. So I think it's imperative that whatever Medicaid funds are used to support healthcare reform efforts, that there's a check on the system, that the people who receive Medicaid in the state are somehow benefited. And I wanna say that in the past, and folks who know me, Robin, <laughs> um, Jessica, the, what the board did, what former chair Al Gobey did as chair, and then as secretary Gobey and Corey Gustafson as commissioner of DIVA, to give Vermont's developed DSR funds, system reform funds that could have gone to the nonprofits like the Howard Center, which is so desperate and Washington County Mental Health. Those agencies could have gotten delivery system reform funds. Instead, all of those funds went without a competitive process. And I've documented this ad nauseum directly to OneCare, which also received an additional 10 what million or whatever, just for IT to get to stand up. And where's the public benefit in all of that money? And then you change the rules so that they don't ever have to show that we saved anyone any money or anyone's ever better, better off or the admin costs um, didn't exceed the so-called savings and on it goes. So I would just like to see in principle one, something added that says, whatever's done with Medicare shouldn't adversely impact Medicaid or Medicaid beneficiaries. Or since we like to focus on the positive, would ben measurably benefit Medicaid beneficiaries, including people with disabilities who in the AHEAD model stand to benefit because equity would go to people with disabilities are the largest underserved health equity group, so much low hanging fruit there. If our providers were accessible and our service providers had a decent wage better than working at McDonald's. So that's my comment. Please don't rob Medicaid or use it as the piggy bank to sort support these efforts to save Medicare money. SASH does it, lots of programs do it. It's not good, thank you. Thank you for that comment. Um, one thing you said I want to respond to, um, just to make you aware or others, is the, the board did recently publish in response to the Vermont State Auditor, uh, a return on investment analysis from the perspective of Medicaid and Vermont commercial payers. It's on our website. Um, I can miss Aaron if I have your email, so I'll try and email that to you in, um, this afternoon. But we did look no, at it in great. terms of total total cost of care targets for Medicaid and commercial, and how one care's performance, um, how one care performed as to those targets for those specific payers. Getting yep. at your point of, we don't want all these efforts to really have an adverse impact on our state payers. Um, but thanks for raising you know, that I, point. I, I want to say because of some of the brilliant minds involved at DIVA in payment reform and in value-based payments, um, the Medicaid, Vermont Medicaid really has led a lot of the effort to really do a true global payment without a true up. I mean, there's a lot of good that came out of DIVA's total all in on um, the ACO model and that, you know, all pair, a lot of, good lessons, I think, you know, come out of like that work. So, so I'm not, I don't want to dismiss that out of hand as, you know, negative. It's just that there's been a cost to the Medicaid's other beneficiaries, the folks I serve, that has just gone un, 
unacknowledged, and I just want to see that repeated. Great, thank you. I think it's a fair point. Um, Walter, hey, how are you? Hey, Owen, how's it going? Pretty good. I, uh, <laughs> just pretty good. <laughs> I enjoyed. I enjoyed the discussion of the uh, affordability issue, and Mike Fisher raised some great comments. And the issue of affordability is always one that's interesting to me because no one has defined exactly what it is. And does it constitute, for example, co-pays and the enormous deductibles that many of us have to pay? I just got hit with one, for example. And that is part of the big problem for patients of the afford of this issue of affordability is that you never know what the costs are on the other end. Um, and will this address that issue? It's the insurance companies passing payments on to us. So that's always one issue. Another one is, you know, the issue of access. We all know it's the access and the so-called unable to afford it are pretty much tied together. So I'm wondering if there is a way to come up with some measure, and I hate to use the word measure, but my brain is tired right now from six days of work. So I won out in the hot sun. So I wonder if there's some way to measure that. Like, is it what's affordable for someone making twenty-five thousand a year, thirty thousand a year, and so on and so forth? Because those are the real problems, you know. Huge, huge problem, and I don't know as a state that we've quite gotten there yet in terms of the best way to measure it. Once you start going into any of these and trying to find the best way, it it does get very difficult. Um, I think we have it published. I know we had a board hearing on our effort at coming up with an affordability standard. And you're spot on, Walter. Some of the issues that you raised were some of the challenges that we and the stakeholders had in navigating to come up with the best uh, approach. But um, I can see if someone can send you what we had on that, because I'd certainly value your input on it too. Although we're not, we're not there yet. Um, I think we put it aside for a little bit until we can um, resolve a couple of the issues. Mr. Del Treco. Let's see if I have my clicks right here, Owen. Can you see and hear me? You, you're on it. You got it. Great. Um, so first of all, um, thanks for the hard work and attention to detail here. Uh, at the board and, the, and that AHS is putting, putting into this work. Um, by evidence of this conversation, this work is difficult, technical, and complicated and needs the attention that is being applied. Um, also, thanks for allowing me to address the board. Um, you know, this is a significant um, project and there are significant uh, uh, implications for Vermont hospitals and the communities we serve, um, and that includes uh, patients, families, friends. Um, I believe that most every opportunity comes with some risk, and sometimes the risks are greater force, and sometimes they're not. Although I believe the AHEAD model could be beneficial, these principles are striving to uh, the point of understanding the details and helping us to, to uh, move towards measuring that risk. Um, so if we enter into a negotiation, it sounds like we are, um, I recommend that the negotiators prioritize the opportunities and make clear go and no go limits or decision points along the way. Um, each each opportunity should be weighted and prioritized. For VAS, we evaluate policies and new ideas through the lens of the following principles: equitable equitable high quality access, stabilization for hospitals promotion of a strong ecosystem and predictability. My next comments, I've tried to tag back to your principles, um, and I did that a little bit on the fly here today um, because they were moving around, but but let me go ahead and, and start with some of the uh, comments. And, and this one's, I think, tied to number six. There's so much uncertainty, which is generally expected in this type of work. It's not a knock at all. It's just what we're going through. 
but yet we we don't necessarily see the evidence that identifies how and where this model is better for Vermonters or improves affordability by putting downward pressure on commercial rates. Um, tied to numbers two and three of your principles, it's unclear how the model improves the ecosystem challenges we're managing. Without improving access to care outside our hospitals, the access challenges in long-term care, skilled nursing, mental health, substance misuse that we've all been talking about will remain and unfortunately will continue to drive delivery system pressures and relief for communities and caregivers will not be improved. Tied to number four, I believe, as we evaluate the model, it's so very important to remember our hospitals are in financial jeopardy. And the principle of the head model is constraint, not stabilization. Simply, the objective is to save the federal government money. I believe Vermont has accomplished this already, and I'm not sure this has improved Vermont's delivery system. When we entered the all-payer model with similar uncertainty, we had stronger balance sheets, um, and I worry that there's no room for error now. Um, we discussed this briefly today, and or you all discussed this briefly today, but growth rates in the model, in my estimation, are suboptimal. Um, Medicare is not always right, and tying our growth rate to Medicare market basket or something that is not tied to real inflation, inflationary pressures is a problem. Workforce and pharmaceutical increases in our industry continue to drive the day and a market basket set at 3% um, when expenses are in this 6 to 8% range, not only in Vermont, but regionally and nationally is a recipe for disaster. Number, I think the next point's tied to number three. Although we've di discussed many concepts and methodologies and have a better understanding of the details, and I actually applaud you uh, and the board and AHS for doing this, this work, there remains great uncertainty how global budgets will be set, how nimble the model will be, and, and how quickly it could be adjusted in, in, in areas of problems. Um, I think the board has done a nice job in discussing the mechanics and I think mechanics matter. Um, hospitals need to see this and have an opportunity to stress test this model against their healthcare service area demands. Um, and by way of example, one of the things that is pointed to in the in the documents are efficiency measures. I don't know what those are. I don't know how they work. I don't know where they plug in. And there's many examples of that. And, and, I, and I think we have talked about the mechanics in many places. Um, but with, but with all of this uncertainty, I think there remains one thing that mitigates much of the risk, um, and and it's the possibility of of um, infusion of federal funding. So tied to number one, if we can improve in federal funding and dollars coming into the state, um, I, I think we are on the correct path. If we cannot do that, I think this path is fraught with problems, more administrative expense, more challenges, and I don't think that's a path we should per pursue. Funding to help with affordability and hospital sta stabilization, I think needs to be prioritized first in the negotiation. The resources need to be real and recognized. They can't be tied to grant applications, bizarre formulas, or some complicated equation with hooks. I've seen implementations like this in the past and they don't work. They're they're just the funding gets diluted. We're not sure why it was brought in, where it went, how it was used. And I, I we need to avoid that all at all costs. I think my next point is tied to number five and six. More specifically, if commercial premium relief is a priority, hospitals will need significant Medicare resources directed to base budgets. That recognizes one historical savings, two historical Medicare cost shifts and three necessary margins to invest in their staff facilities and communities. And when I say communities, it's not only uh, their organizations, but it's other uh, healthcare organizations, it's the arts, it's the sciences, it's their local high schools. Healthcare is much, much more beyond the four walls of a hospital. Um, I think this point's tied to number one, um, and, I, and, I, and I give credit to all all uh, parties that have worked in the in healthcare and on reform. I think Vermont has done an outstanding job in saving money for the federal government. And I know it's not perfect, and I know we're not uh, we're not the poster child of reform here in Vermont. But I think we're ahead of the curve in many in many aspects. But I'm not sure it's helped us. 
In fact, I would argue that our justified efforts to move towards value-based care may have unintentionally harmed our delivery system. Um, those savings haven't helped us. They've helped budget dust in a federal budget. So um, we need resources returned to Vermont in an effective manner that starts with stabilizing our hospitals and stabilizing our delivery system. Um, I really want to appreciate and, and acknowledge the work of your board, um, your work, uh, Owen and AHS, and I appreciate the hard work and, and the and the attention to detail and the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, so thanks, thanks again. Uh, thank, thank you, Mike. And I think that was really well said. And I, I, I know those are a lot of sentiments and thoughts that many board members have had as well. Um, I don't have it in front of me. I know you'd sent me some public comments recently in the last week or two. Um, do you have a set of your view of go, no go um, in prioritizing the various opportunities? Or if you don't, could you, uh, would you be willing to provide that to us? Yeah, I, I, I think I identified it in my conversation here. Um, if, if there's not a sufficient federal infusion um, I think we enter into a space of administrative complication for for to what end and what and to what benefit around bettering the ecosystem, putting downward pressure on commercial premiums. Um, you know, a tenant of the all payer model was was just that. Um, and whether we were successful or not, and how that has all worked, I, I you know we could debate that and, and say it was great or not great, but I do think we have an opportunity to um, not recreate uh, history, but to do it better. Understood, agreed. Um, Walter? Uh, thanks, Owen. I just want to say I agree with Mike Del Treco about his assessment of value-based care. It, <clears throat> you know, he said it, so I won't reiterate it, but I think he's right on about this experiment really hasn't it's exacerbated our problems yeah i i, I um well, spoke publicly a week ago about this with with others and um it is really concerning the hospital finances and the sustainability and the broader uh demographic challenges we have are getting worse and those will have serious repercussions on our healthcare system writ large and hospital sustainability and affordability. These challenges are going to get worse and with the housing crisis and with the demographic shifts we're seeing, it's a very, very, very dark set of clouds and I'm very worried about it. I'm very worried about the hospital sustainability with where we are currently and what's been going on. Um, so this got to be a bit of a heavy conversation today, although it's warranted, and I think something many of us have been worrying about for a bit here. Um, is there any other public comment at this time? Can I ask a, a, a question of, of you and fellow board members regarding one of Susan Aronoff's comments, which is, is there a place in these principles to capture the idea um, she mentioned for principle one, but it almost seems to relate a little bit to me to principle six. If money from Medicare or commercial is being used to, sorry, if money from Medicaid or commercial is being used to bolster a Medicare health reform methodology, that does not seem right to me. So I, I don't know if there's a possibility of weaving. Uh, it's not really reducing Medicaid's costs, but um, you know, avoiding shifting costs to Medicaid. If we were to use the cost shift terminology, or I don't, I don't know if there's other language that would be appropriate there. Um, I, one response I'd have is when I read consumer affordability. I think of that as all Vermonters, whether they're paying Medicaid taxes or commercial insurance. I think we generally speak about commercial insurance, but affordability is also the taxes that support Medicaid. Um, Ms. Aronoff?
Uh, you're muted. All right. I was just going to suggest maybe adding to the principles something of trying to do no harm. No harm to the hospitals, no harm to Medicaid, and like just trying not to make things worse. So going back to, I'm curious what Member Lunge thinks, but I want to make sure that this does for me in my head as I'm hearing all this challenge where ahead is the Medicaid methodology, the commercial methodology, the Medicare methodology, keeping in mind AHS does a Medicaid global budget methodology, not the CARE board. And is this, I guess the question is the appropriate place and can we do it with the methodology? Um, and I think member Lunge is probably the closest. I think it, I think what we should do um, is think about a principle in the ahead approach. Um, or if we end up doing a broader, like a head plus other uh, healthcare reform principles, because obviously a head is mostly focused on Medicare, although there is alignment principles for Medicaid. I think the, the issue that Sue raised um, came up because the vehicle for both the Medicaid and Medicare payment methodology was an external entity. Um, at least with Medicare, Medicare will be implementing the methodology directly. So I think there's less risk of that happening again because there won't be an intermediary in between Medicare and the providers. But I think um, we should think about it for the broader set of principles when we're trying to think about how the whole system works together. That makes sense to me. I, I'm comfortable with that. I just, thanks for discussing it. Yeah, I mean, there are things in federal law like you can't use Medicaid dollar, Medicare dollars to match Medicaid dollars, and vice versa. You can't commingle the federal funds directly. So, um, I think those protections are are sort of built into this model more strongly because of the lack of the interme intermediary on the Medicare side. Board members prepared to vote on the principles as modified by discussion today? I'm okay. Sure. I don't sense a great feeling of enthusiasm. <laughs> And maybe that is reflective of all the challenges that this entails. Um, so if people don't support it, they don't support it. Um, why don't we go ahead and vote and see how we do and um, we'll go from there. But I think this really does call a lot of question and issues that have been kind of percolating for a little bit on this. Um, so I'll make the motion and, and we can have discussion after if people uh, have additional thoughts they want to share. Um, I move that we delegate to the Green Mountain Care Board staff the submission of a draft, non-binding, Vermont-specific Medicare global payment methodology and specification consistent with the principles outlined on slide six, as has been modified today. I'll second. Board members have additional thoughts they want to share um, prior to taking the vote. Is there any additional public comment? All those in favor say aye. 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 And the motion is approved. And staff, you are now delegated the. <laughs> yeah. 
Thank you all. Um, I will update that language to just say GMCB staff too. Elena and I were unsure if you wanted to name a specific position title, so we just left it. Yeah, I think GMCB staff is appropriate. Okay, okay. thank you. Are we having, Mr. Gree, are we having additional discussion on the AHEAD methodology today? Just we do not principles. have, yep, just the principles today. Um, and from the conversation today, including public comment today, um, Elena and I will revise, um, like work on continuing to revise the AHEAD specific principles and hopefully bring those to you at a you know, relatively soon uh, upcoming meeting. Probably, I think we have a couple scheduled in June um, to start talking about that again, not knowing if we've been accepted into the model yet or not, um, but we'll start to, to really think through those. Great, thank you. Thank okay. you. Um, thanks, Michelle. Uh, that's all we had on the agenda today. Um, any old or new business for the board? And I will move to adjourn. Second. All in favor, say aye. 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 We're adjourned. Thank you.